Hi, everyone. It's one o'clock and you are most welcome to this webinar. Uh, we will today present results from an interesting research project about gender in the ITS sector. And the project is financed by the Nordic Council of Ministers. Um, I have the honor to moderate this session. My name is Christian Dumien, and I'm a researcher and consultant at uh, Trivector Traffic. Um, we have partners in the project. Uh, mainly, we have interest organizations for the ITS sector in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, and uh, Finland and Estonia. Uh, we also have EIT Urban Mobility, which is an uh, EIT Urban Mobility is also a partner in this project. Um, EIT Urban Mobility is an initiative of, of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, a body of the European Union. It's Europe's largest innovation community for urban mobility and works to accelerate the transition uh, towards more sustainable, inclusive and livable uh, cities. Uh, we also have uh, Trivector Traffic, um, which we are the project coordinators, uh, and we are uh, consultants and researchers within sustainable mobility and transport, and we are located in Lund, Stockholm, Göteborg, and Luleå. Um, I will soon present the agenda, uh, but first of all, um, I would let you know that the chat is open for questions. So you can write your questions there at any time. And we will try to respond, to respond as much as possible. Uh, if, if time doesn't allow, please send an email to us and we will uh, reply by email afterwards. And you will see our email addresses at the end of the presentations. So let's go to the agenda. This is the agenda for this hour. And now we have a short introduction by me. And then we will get some, um, my colleague, uh, Julia Nyberg will present uh, the research project, uh, some background information about women, men, transport, and tech, and then shortly results from the study. And then we have uh, an interesting uh, panel that will discuss uh, and present, make comments on the, the results. And then we have a small uh, panel discussion. And at the end, we will try to, uh, as much as possible, uh, respond to your uh, questions from the chat. Um, so let's move to the uh, next slide. So here we have our um, three panelists. Uh, we have Anna Clark uh, from Trivector Traffic. She's a researcher and responsible for uh, the head, or she's head of area digitalization at Trivector, uh, and is one of the initiators of uh, this uh, research, uh, research project, and she will comment on the results. Uh, then we have uh, Marianne Weinreich, uh, who is a mobility consultant. And for almost 25 years, she has advised public authorities, transport operators, and private companies about sustainable mobility policy and promotion. And then we have uh, Lasse Schelde uh, from IDA, which is Denmark's largest interest group and trade union for IT, natural sciences, and engineering with 160,000 members. Uh, and IDA has 12 different political focus areas, two of which are green transportation and equality. And then we have Julia Nyberg, uh, who is a consultant at Trivector and focuses on social sustainability issues and is part of the project team. Uh, and Julia will, will present results uh, from the project. And then Anna, Marianne and Lasse will make uh, interesting comments. So let's move on and I uh, open the floor for Julia Nyberg who will present the project and some interesting results. Thank you, Christian. Uh, so good to be here and see that we are uh, so many people that are uh, listening. Christian just gave us uh, uh, some short information about the project. Um, and here's just 
the info again, I think. Uh, it was funded by the Nordic Council of Ministers, and you can see on the screen our collaboration partners in the project. Um, I would like to add that um, the primary aim of this project was to build a long-lasting collaboration to promote more gender equal and sustainable transport uh, in the Nordics. Um, it was a, a relatively small project, I would say, and the, our focus has been on uh, networking in collaboration. So a lot of our results is within this discussions that we have had in the project. Uh, however, one part has also been to collect some data within gender equality in the Nordics and within the ITS sector. So uh, I will show you some results from that today. Um, in total, this project have consisted of five parts or actually consists of five parts since we're not really finished yet. We will uh, still uh, do the last three steps uh, during the following week. So you will have the, pre 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 the first uh, <laughs> results today. So that's it, let's start. Uh, I would like to give you some uh, background information about why gender equality matters in the transport sector and the tech sector. Um, and actually, it's uh, ITS studies or previous studies on ITS uh, and gender equality is scarce. Instead, we must, must turn to studies on gender equality in tech and gender equality in transport separately. Uh, and with help from these separate, separated areas, we can understand the ITS sector to some extent. And both the transport sector and the tech sector is male dominated. Statistics from Eurostat from 2019 shows that both sectors only have 17% women in the workforce. Uh, and in Sweden, where I live, uh, the numbers for women in tech is slightly higher, 20% numbers from 2020. But actually in 2014, 86% of the girls, girls at the end of elementary school stated that they were interested in tech-oriented uh, subjects. But somewhere we are missing out on these girls. They are not in the sector today, maybe. From research, we see that representation in work groups and decision-making is crucial for women and men to influence our common future society and participate in unequal terms. But what we show, research also show is that representation, the number of female and male bodies, and they can, it cannot alone solve the issue with gender inequality. It's also about, as you maybe know, for example, speaking time and power in various decisions. But also in research, it's shown that prevailing norms is also crucial uh, to, uh, to create gender equality. And in the case of transport planning, we know that traditionally it has been a rational and economic practice focusing on moving a person from point A to point B at the lowest cost possible. And in tech, we often talk about a young male genius sitting in a basement coding and developing the future. And within these norms, both men and women have been educated both as student, student at the university or school, but also as people in the sector or in society as well. That means that it's not enough to ensure equal numbers of bodies in the room, but also you have to discuss the prevailing norms and how we can challenge them to achieve a different, more gender equal outcome. And now you might wonder how these norms affect women in the sector. Well, there's a study published in 2023 showing that one of the most common reasons women are not striving to become an entrepreneur in the tech sector is a lack of social acceptance, a feeling of discrimination, uh, and also a lack of role models in the sector. And this indicates that women are not feeling welcome in the environment and cannot see others like them in, for example, higher positions. So norms are affecting career choice and possibilities. Now some examples about uh, how the recruitment process can affect uh, representation and how norms affect the recruitment. So <clears throat> the recruitment process can be seen as something that just is as it is as, is as it is and as it has always been. But how the recruitment process is done can affect who is applying. And research has shown that 
uh, subtly biased job ad language can deter women from applying for jobs. And such language could be gender specific pronouns and the overuse of description that has historically been coded as masculine. And the problem with this language is that it will remind people of their mi minority status in a negative way and therefore give a feeling of not belonging in the company or the group even before they even started at, at this job. Another example on how norms influence on the recruitment process is that we tend to recommend people like ourselves people with the same competence or the same gender. And we tend to think that our next leader uh, will be like the one we had before. And in a male dominated sector like tech and transport, this will lead to even more, even more males in the sector and even more masculine norms. So as you can see here, representation and norms are linked uh, to each other. Another theme highlighted in research is uh, travel patterns of men and women. Uh, and these uh, are often presented in transport planning research, but I think it's very also interesting for, uh, for us when we are developing ITS solutions too. So uh, in general, we can see that men are traveling longer distances than women. Men also make more work-related trips, while women are more likely to uh, do care trips and trip chaining, which is um, uh, when you do more than one errand during the same trip. And another important uh, aspect is that men and women travel roughly the same amount by public transportation, but men take fewer and longer trips while women travel more frequent, frequently, um, but then for shorter trips. And another thing that could be interesting for ITS is um, from a Swedish study. Uh, it shows that women value sustainability and transport safety higher than men. And uh, all of these differences, and uh, um, it's actually um, from a new international study that uh, reinforces that differences in travel patterns between women and men. Uh, is not uh, solely dependent on differences in economy, employment, and car ownership. Even when those differences are uh, removed, you can still see differences in men's and women's travel patterns. So it's an important thing to have in mind. And then one last picture before uh, we continue to uh, the results of the study. And here I will give you an example on how gender inequality can be a barrier for innovation. And this example uh, comes from a book called At Uppfinna Världen in Swedish, which can be translated to, um, to invent the world. Uh, it's about the roller suitcase. And the roller suitcase was first invented in the end of uh, 1987, even though the wheel was invented 5,000 years earlier. Crazy, right? Uh, this means that we were able to put people on the moon before we could invent the roller suitcase. And this is a classical dilemma in innovation. Why was it like this? And uh, Catherine Mascal, who, is, who has written this book, she has been thinking about this and found pictures of women with rolling suitcases long before 87. The reason this innovation came rel relatively late according to Marcel, is that uh, there were assumptions about gender and gender norms. Uh, back in before 87, there was an idea that men uh, would not roll their suitcases since a real man carry his bag, even though it's heavy. And women, no, they do, they do not travel alone. They travel with the, their men, and therefore the man will carry their bags for them. And with this in mind, it's not that weird that the rolling suitcase was not invented until the labor market changed and women started to travel in work more. So um, over to some results. I hope that this short information about women and, in, and men in the transport and tech sector gave you some new information. And now I will talk uh, about some results from our study. And first, um, 
this uh, on the slide you can see um, some of the results from the the project group's first workshop where we talked about norms in our different countries. Of course, there were um, also differences. For example, in Iceland, traffic safety wasn't uh, considered as important or uh, as it was in the other Nordic countries. But maybe the problems with traffic safety isn't as big there either. Uh, but here you can see some of the main factors that we had in common. And um, first, we concluded that the IT sector in the nor all of the Nordic countries is male dominated. And to some extent, we uh, saw that, or we discussed that there is equal numbers when it comes to staff, when you look at all of the staff. But when you look at management and leading positions, it is not equal yet. And we also concluded that uh, the ITS sector today is car-centered. Another thing that we discussed was um, a funnel thinking, or as we now call it, a leaky pipeline. Um, the leaky pipeline in this case is uh, the ITS sector, and this leaky pipeline is uh, riddled with holes. And as a woman, you, you go through your professional career and women tend to leak out from this pipeline, pipeline, which is the ITS sector. And we discussed this and add some uh, examples that were clear to us. Um, one crucial part of women's professional career is when they at a young age get information about career opportunities, uh, what they could work with in the future. And later when they apply for their first job, we tend, we tend to see that women are leaking out of this pipe. Uh, and later on also, when you develop skills in leadership, you don't, you, you're you also leaking out of the leadership pipe in some cases. Um, and then this, in this uh, example on the screen, uh, we haven't mentioned aspects of person, personal life that might affect the professional career as well, such as kids and taking care of family members. And we don't think that this leaky pipeline is uh, perfect in any case, but we think it's a way to vis visualize how challenges, uh, when they come and when and how how they look in uh, women's career in the ITS sector. Uh, besides the workshop, which, which was an important part of the project, we have also uh, collected some data to get a first glimpse on gender equality in the ITS sector in the Nordics. Uh, and we um, developed this survey together with the project group when we met at our first workshop, and we handed it out to people in the sector, colleagues and so on. Um, and it, we primar primarily, we uh, sent it out through newsletters and social media channels. And the purpose was to gain insights into gender equality efforts within the ITS sector. And we try to focus on norms, uh, but still we also ask questions about representation since we see that both are important. And um, before I continue, uh, I would like to say that we also, we see that there is a response bias due to the topic. And we also, since we st stated clearly that we were asking about gender equality, uh, we had 60% women answering, and most of the answers came from people in the age of uh, 40 to 60 years old. And since we have uh, a response bias and also only got 55 answers, these results is only a first indication on gender equality in the sector. It is not, it is not perfect, and it, it won't show the whole sector, but it can give an, a first indication. And of course, more research on this topic is needed. So first representation, more than half of the responses show that uh, their organization have a formal gender equality policy, but still there is not an even gender distribution among staff uh, or in decision-making bodies yet in all of these organizations. Um, and these results show a will to contribute to a more gender equal sector with the policy, uh, but it takes time and still it's hard to get and an, an even gender distribution. And one reason could be that the organizations find it hard to recruit women. 
when we ask for the company's biggest challenges when it comes to gender equality, we found this reoccurring theme. In the responses, we can see that it's uh, a challenge to get women to apply for jobs or uh, that the ones that actually applied for the job did not have the right competences. And as shown before, and as I told you before, we know that there is a way of affecting our recruitment process and to make it more diverse and inclusive and equal by looking at the underlying norm affecting our language, who we are searching for and who we uh, think could be a leader or, or think work in the ITS sector or the tech sector. And we also try to see what norms are present in the ITS sector today. And here we use a theoretical framework that help us to put sustainability and gender equality norms in various categories to help us to better understand. And with help from this framework, we can see that technical masculinity norms are the most common in the answers. And these technical masculinities are um, often characterized by technical knowledge, but also a top-down approach when it comes to innovation and design and planning, and also economical growth. Uh, but actually, the second most common norms are eco-femininities. And these norms are recognized by a holistic approach, sustainability, and care for vulnerable groups such as elderly or children. And surprisingly, uh, sustainability, equality, and economy, as you can see in the bottom, were three common words when respondents were asked what values uh, were important in decision making in their own organizations. It was a bit surprisingly, but also, again, as I said, it's important to remember that we have a small group that answered, and uh, this group also uh, is biased, uh, which of course can affect these results. In the survey, we also asked if the organizations reflect on for whom they are developing ITS solutions today. And many of them did. Around 70% said that they, uh, to some extent, or uh, did reflect on uh, the target group. Then when we asked for who the target group is, uh, the most common words, uh, you can see it to the right on the picture, it was people, companies, urban people, car users, and all citizens. And um, why is this important? <laughs> well, there is often a good intention uh, when saying that you want to develop solutions for everyone, all citizens or people or human beings and so on. However, however the, the thing is that historically, when we have planned a transport system for, uh, for everyone, no one said that we will just plan for commuting men. Planners thought that they were planning what was best for all. Despite these good intentions, prevailing norms led to a focus on rationality and economy and taking one person from one place to another at a low cost, as I told you before. And other perspectives were lost. What about the uh, when what about the, the trips to grocery shopping, for example? Therefore, it is a good idea to reflect on norms in a sector and see what is taken for granted and also challenge that. So who are we thinking about when we say people or all citizens. I think we have to reflect on that more. So the last question for today, from me at least, does gender matter in the ITS sector? According to the answers, we can see both yes and no. As I said earlier, we have respondents saying that sustainability, equality, and economy was important in decision-making in their organizations. And I mean, it's pretty big that equality is, is one of the three words here. At the same time, it occurs uh, answer saying that gender doesn't matter and I don't get the gender problem here. All data is for people and not for gender. And as I said before, we know that women and men travel in different ways. We know that women and men experience the transport system in different ways and also value different things in the transport system. For example, I said the uh, sustainability and the traffic safety. And we also know that norms can affect what we design and, and who uh, is recruited to develop said solutions. 
So I will also add that it's not about making women and men doing the same things, but to develop solutions that will suit several groups of people, not only one group, but more groups, so we get better solutions. And some main findings. Um, overall, we can see a will to change the sector to a more gender equal sector. And responses show that a lot of, action, of actions have been taken when it comes to equal salaries and policies, for example. Um, but still, there's a lot of focus on representation today. We can see both in our internal workshop, but also from the answers in the survey. But we know that representation or accounting bodies alone won't fix gender inequality. So focusing slowly, solely on um, representation won't fix the holes in this leaky pipe end. And we will still have women disappearing or leaking from this pipe, pipe end if we only focus on representation. We think that we have to focus on the larger issues in our power pipeline, which is the norms. Uh, by changing the norms and noticing how they affect many of our processes, we might be able to fix a large number of leaks. We have to recognize our blind spots, the parts of the processes and discussions that we take for granted, like who are we planning for? Is, this, is it a commuting man, children, elderly, so on? What kind of trips are we aiming uh, our solution at? Is it, the, again, commuter trips, or is it uh, the trip for grocery shopping or for going to the cinema? And who could work with ITS? But also, what is included in innovation? What is an innovation? And we also think that we have to use data on women and men to better understand their needs and behaviors and, and uh, be able to create and cost, uh, more customized solutions for the future. Uh, so my last question then is uh, what our next rolling suitcase will be. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Julia, for this really good and interesting presentation. Uh, I've had a look in the chat and there are uh, no direct questions. So I um, believe it was a very clear presentation. Thanks a lot. So I think we move directly now to the next part of this uh, webinar, uh, where we will get comments from our panelists, uh, who you can see here in the, um, uh, on the picture. So I would like to, um, they will the panelists will have three to five minutes to comment on the results, and then uh, we will have a small, small discussion. So I would like to invite uh, Anna Clark uh, to start with your reflections from, from the project and the presentation that Julia did. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Julia, for a, a lovely presentation. I think it really placed the, the topic really in the right place. I think one of the things that I really take from from what's been done in this project, but, but it was we were asked to think a bit, a bit how we can place this within our industry perspective is the question of why is it important to look at this? Why, why do we care about gender equality at all? I mean, surely I mean, this came up also in, in the responses and discussions that, that we had, it should just be good for everyone and then it'll, then it'll be fine. Uh, you know, we're gonna have a great uh, system. And I think it's good to delve a little bit into this issue of like, why is it important to do this? And, and why isn't it okay just to say good for everyone? If we're thinking about ITS, we're thinking about, you know, digitalization of the transport system. We're thinking about products, mobility services, you know, software products that we're developing. We're thinking about the data that we're generating and collecting. And these services need to be made for different people to, based on their needs and so that everybody can have equal opportunities for reaching things. So we need to think about, you know, collecting data for the different groups. And I'm sure that some of the other panelists, panelists would talk about this as well. Um, and because if we don't do that, we, we, we're not gonna be able to see how we can develop things for specific groups. Um, and the other thing, the other main thing I was thinking about from this, um, 
uh, study was also the need for us to think about the norms that we're in. And of course, we're all working in norms and that's also linked to you know, biases that, that we have. And we need to recognize these biases that, that we have and that we're working in the norms. And relating to our own industry, my own industry experience, I was thinking of a couple of things this week that maybe bring this, this home a lot. And, and I'm sure other women in this, uh, who are also listening will recognize these things. Um, a couple of things related to my own experience. I, I was actually in a meeting the other day where, I mean, usually when I'm in a meeting and I don't know people, I, I do this whole spiel of, you know, uh, oh, I've got a PhD in transport modeling and I'm an applied mathematician and uh, I've got 15 years of industry experience so that, you know, people accept, accept me in the room. And I didn't do that in this meeting I was in because most people knew me. And the one person in the group I was talking to who didn't know me, this person literally turned their back on me <laughs> because they had a preconceived notion. I just said, I'm Anna, I work at Trivector. This person turned their back on me and didn't include me in the conversation because I hadn't done this and they didn't know me. And, they, and, they, and there was the, the, the perception of you know, the person that I was. I was also the youngest, and that doesn't happen to me so often anymore. I was the youngest person in this group. And it was, it was sort of an interesting thing to happen. And, and it's due to the fact that it was a pre preconceived notion of who I was coming into that room. And this happens still, and it makes a difference. And what was absolutely fantastic actually in this group was, who were mainly men in the group, I have to say, that they actually, they the, the other people brought me back in. They were the allies who helped me back in. And so there was also that important thing. Um, and the other, the other anecdote that I have from my personal experience this week was uh, this morning, I have two kids. Um, and uh, this morning I had to organize a lot of things. My, my kids have a lot of activities and I, there was so much that I needed to prepare this morning and, so many things and where we were going to cycle or walk to work or how we were going to, you know, it was, it was just so much logistics involved. When I got to work at eight o'clock this morning, I felt that my day was already over, <laughs> you know, because I'd already achieved so much by, you know, this point in the day. That is also, that is obviously going to impact, you know, the, this logistics and everything related to that is obviously going to impact, you know, how I work and the things that I bring to work. And that needs to be recognized as well. And, and how all of this within the sector and how we do that, how we, how we can use that is, is very important to consider. So yeah, we have to de disaggregate data and we have to think about norms. That's my main points. And I will pass on to the next uh, panelist for some comments now. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna. And I, I really appreciate that you, you exemplify with, with your personal experiences, because I think we need these we need to 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 see what what like the, the theoretical frameworks we work with what what are they in 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 real real life what what things are really happening here um just a, a short um reflection you, you said that we have to motivate and we have to i think we have to be very clear about why is this important because apparently it's it's not clear we see that from the from the uh, from the survey, so I think this there we have definitely work to do to to mm. to come with more more knowledge and and to motivate why is it important uh, to work with these questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna. We will keep on the discussion here soon. Uh, then I leave um, the floor to Marianne. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the great presentation, Julia. Um, yes, I think Anna, you touched upon two important issues here personal experience and data to be able to also, you know, scale up the personal uh, experiences and say something uh, more uh, general. Um, and let's remember that gender is not just about women. It's about men and women. I think often we get it wrong in this discussion. And many people think that we, when we say, let's talk about gender, it means let's talk about women. Uh, and then it becomes like, okay, let's have to do that again. Um, I've been working in transport and mobility for almost 25 years. And um, when I started, and, and actually for the first 20 years, gender was 
almost only an issue in EU projects where we had to count how many men and women were in the meetings and how many men and women were affected by some of the initiatives that were carried out. Otherwise, gender was not an issue. And my field, because I'm a humanist in, in this uh, very uh, engineer uh, STEM dominated sector, um, even though it's about users, gender was actually never a strategic topic or something that we really looked into. It wasn't until 2019 that I read uh, Carolina Criado Perez's book, Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men, that I really realized that men and women don't have equal opportunities. And I'm Danish. I was under the strange perception that we had equal opportunities in this world, men and women, but that is not the case. And that's rooted in norms, as you say, but also in some of the structural inequalities that affect us differently. Like the fact that uh, women have a longer maternity leave than, than men uh, has an impact on the fact that women are more likely to travel with children uh, and do groceries. Also the fact that women um, have a higher degree of um, reduced time in, in the paid workforce, uh, don't work necessarily 100%. All these things affect our travel patterns, but also our experience of traveling. And, and that's why also it's not, as you said, Julia, just about bringing in bodies and numbers to equal it out, but also to bring in the different experiences that men and women often have and bring those to the table, both in terms of quantitative, but also in terms of qualitative data and adding value to that and then adding it into the system uh, approach, the design processes and understanding the needs. Because we see a male um, unconscious bias in planning and in design and in tech and in innovation. And uh, realizing this, looking into the data, not only collecting the data, but analyzing the data is a way of uh, creating more equality and more just transportation and mobility for all that is the end goal. Thanks a lot, Marianne, for, for your interesting reflection. You, you were finished, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I good. can definitely uh, speak more, but I'll shut no, that's, up now. No, that's good. I thought it was really interesting that you, you as I understood you, I mean, the, uh, including, I mean, I've been working with gender issues for, for 20 years now. And, and um, I mean, lately, the question has become more and more, uh, more important. But you said that the gender issues started in EU projects in a way, which is interesting. But in Denmark, it came later. And we always see the Nordic countries as, as a, as, as gender equal. Uh, so so that, that was an interesting uh, reflection. Just a short question. How do you think, since you've been working long in, in the sector, do you see a difference between like the transport sector and, and gender? And then more when we talk about the, the transport and ITS, so the combination of, of transport and tech, can you see, is there a difference in how gender is included from your own experiences? I think that there are similar issues. My bias is that tech is probably even more male dominated. The numbers said uh, otherwise, mm. but that was my uh, understanding. I would say that the challenge that we have in Denmark is that we are under the false illusion that we have solved the inequality issues. And that means that people are very reluctant and actually opposed to discussing this, mm. both among, among men and women. And the, during the last five years, I've been talking a lot about gender issues. Um, and there is a lot of op opposition. And, and also your research show, the, the survey show that there is like, why do we have to talk about this? 
Mm. And uh, that is in itself uh, one of the challenges, mm. uh, that lack of uh, understanding. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was I was a bit shocked about those results. Actually, I thought we had come come further, but it's it's really interesting. Okay, thanks a lot, Marianne. Now I leave the word to Lasse, who who will make the last last comments here before we we discuss together. So please, Lasse. Thanks. I get to mansplain in the end. Uh, no, <clears throat> I would actually start off by also uh, you could say agreeing first of all with Anna. I think. Uh, there should be a lot of, you could say, work put into this. Uh, why is it important? That should actually be the starting point because if you leave people and say, oh, it's, it's about gender, or it's, it, this is a, an important issue, you you could say, or oh, we who would like this discussion forget to kind of frame it in the right context. So this why is it important is really good to start with because that changes the discussion, I would say. Uh, and I would completely agree also with uh, Marianne. Uh, and I would say you could say in a sense you could say the current system when you have the, these discussions then uh, you will have uh, also have uh, women who are you could say in let's say positions in society often <coughs> people who are leaders already uh, who would say what's the problem and the point is here that it kind of confirms a system that favors the strong so you have women who in many ways kind of defy the norm in a sense and so we need to have a, a you could say a more systematic approach that doesn't uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be that you have to be a very strong and kind of uh, in a sense maybe a bit aggressive um, that it has to kind of be broader than that um, and then thirdly I would say to my experience with um, not only ITS but urban planning also and more in general I would say one of the big challenges in transport is what Julia also talked about. This about uh, you could say that there are a lot of um, norms and rules that are you could say applied by society, and we have this rational way of thinking about transport. Um, the irony, in a sense, in about transport, at least in Denmark, that could be a difference, Julia, uh, is that it's not about creating uh, you could say cost-effective uh, transportation. In a sense, it's about um, actually that the people who just happen to be male drive cars, earn the most amount of money. Therefore, the rentability, the return of a freeway is in general a lot higher than a uh, or, or public transport. So, so you could say, so you have a system that affirms, you could say uh, a system where we already know that we have uh, majority of male who drive cars who make the most money so in that sense you kind of affirm these uh, questions constantly uh, in terms of traffic planning that's on the broad scale and you could say when you go further down we have uh, as an example we have these um, train station renovations uh, done to the rail system around Copenhagen and I would say the renovations are actually really nice. They have actually thought quite a lot about uh, you get up from a tunnel and they have replaced uh, what used to be more kind of boards with glass. So you could say it's transparent who are behind the walls and so on. And it's actually also well lit. But then you can say the scope of that project is, of course, limited by money and so on. But that means that they have not looked at the light on the rest of the uh, station area. So. You can only you can only you have only kind of solved it, you could say where the scope was, and that's of course that makes sense, but then you still have you could say maybe, I don't know, 50, 75 percent of an area that it still has you could say kind of the old lighting systems that are maybe a bit too far from each other, a bit too dark, and what happens behind. Uh, so you could say it's it's on a lot of different scales. Also, when you look at rest areas, is another example where you could say. You have these voids uh, often behind a rest area by a freeway where somebody else owns the land and nobody has taken that into consideration. Is it a forest? What is it? Uh, and it's not, again, a lot about lighting. You could say it's not probably lit. So you have, and maybe nobody maintained it for 20 years. So you have the situation where you have a rest uh, room situation that basically nobody wants to use because it, it is perceived dangerous. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that's that kind of so for me it's it's there's a lot in many different levels on where uh, we see these um, 
you could say, unsafe situation, I would almost call them. Recently, I saw this really interesting photo um, that where uh, people were put on glasses that, that picks up where you look at. And they had done that in an urban environment, both with men and women, and the differences were just like really clear. And that I think is a good good um, example where you could say here you have a very, very clear example of what are we talking about when we say it's important and why are, uh, you could say, you can just see that people look different places, male pe people try to look very much on the road and the actual thing. And you could see the way that the women's eyes are much more into, you could say, the dark areas, the green areas, what happens behind different things. So very interesting, I think. Yeah. And lastly, just very short, I would say you could say from my, you could say from, from the EDA perspective, uh, I think this is, uh, you could say, also a learning experience for us. We work a lot with equality uh, in general as an organization. But this is, of course, also something that is interesting for us. And um, we also have this program called uh, Engineer the Future that works a lot with getting uh, not only women, but everybody more kind of interested in STEM educations. But uh, but this is definitely also a focus point. And this leaking pipe uh, problems is also very interesting, I think. Thanks a lot, uh, Lasse. I thought it was really interesting. You brought in um, like a di different perspective more the I would say the the, the modeling uh, part and maybe also the the cost benefit analysis part but did I understand you right that you mean that the modeling and the CBAs done today they like reinforce the system we have where uh, for example <laughs> you said I think you said something with the rich men's car trips are valued higher in such uh, calculations what was that what you you meant Yes, actually, it is. I mean, you when you do the, you could say, societal cost-benefit analysis, you look at, you know, how much money is generated if we create road A, and mm -hmm. uh, since we know it's uh, male people who are driving the cars, then the return on a, a motor freeway investment is higher than uh, public transport, as you could say, as a rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, and you could say the question that is lacking is, uh, is that the, you could say, is that the gender division we want uh, what if we wanted more female drivers or we wanted more people using public transport so all these things are kind of not addressed it's just affirming how it was when that study on uh, time uh, value of the danish uh, people was made in 2009 mm. so until that is you could say updated or somebody wants to say maybe we should not just repeat, you could say how it is in 2009, but maybe say we have other standards or other rules, then that will be affirmed every time mm. you have a calculation for a new road. Yeah. What, what is interesting before I, I uh, Marianne, you have your, you raised your hand, but there has been um, uh, in Sweden research done where, where you redo these time value studies, but you just, you pose the questions a bit in different ways and the results are completely different. So that's also a question how, I mean, the models are important, but you have to to to, to put in other uh, aspects also. Uh, Marianne, you have a comment on on this, please. Yeah, it was actually really directly to this because looking historically at how these calculation and what has value has been done, it is done by, to put it bluntly, the patriarchy uh, and reflects a specific values. And an example, GDP doesn't include unpaid care work. If that was included, it would have a huge uh, economic value. Uh, unpaid care works, women do 75 of, of the unpaid care work in the world. But also the fact that travel time, for instance, is the main economic uh, you know, indicator that we, that we measure. But there are other things like uh, traffic safety or feeling of personal safety that could have value, health or other things that are not included. So I think there are also in these structures something very fundamental where we need to, to discuss whether or not it is more male or female uh, norms. Uh, and, and it could be changed if we look at it from a more you could say feministic uh, point of view. A feminist transport model, maybe. 
Thanks, Marianne. Uh, Anna, I'm thinking you you are, uh, as you said before, you, you didn't say that when at your last um, meeting you had there, but you, you are a transport modeler. Uh, do you have any reflections on, on Lasse's perspectives here? Yeah, I, uh, so yeah, so I, I uh, studied applied mathematics and statistics and I got into transport through transport modeling, so traffic modeling um, and optimization. And uh, I describe myself usually these days as the world's most skeptical transport modeler <laughs> because <laughs> I I understand all of these things from a like, very, you know, uh, basic level of how it all works. And, and basically what you put into these models is going to affect what you're getting out. And it's what are you optimizing, actually? What are the what are the values that you're putting into these models and you're, and you're optimizing? And that's going to affect what you're getting out of it. Um, so I'm very skeptical in general about using those. And I, and I have another little anecdote in, in that sphere because I mean, basically these models were created by traffic engineers from the US in the 1950s because they wanted to have a, a sort of quantitative argument for why it was important to build highways through cities. I mean, essentially. Um, and when you take like these methods and you apply them in different things, you extend them and say, oh, well, let's include some other elements of it, then people don't trust them as much. And a good example of that is that when you start evaluating, um, you know, the, the, the uh, health benefits of physical activity for, for cycling infrastructure, for example, uh, people don't believe you how positive it is for society. Like when you do those calculations, you're like, oh yeah, if you build this road, uh, you know, based on the value of time, you're going to have like your, what is it, net present value of 1.2 or so, whatever. For if you build this cycling lane, you're going to have this like benefit value of, you know, 25. It's like, that can't be right. You've calculated something wrong, mm. but you haven't. And, that, and, and prevailing behind that is these norms about, you know, oh, you know, oh, that's not how you calculate, you know, cycling, that's not a real transport mode. So, so the norms are, are, are behind that. So, so even when you're trying to build, you know, take it into the, the, the masculine model, if that's, if that's what it is, you know, with this, this modeling, it's not always going to work because there's already these other ideas about whether it fits in or not. Yeah. So. It's, it's a, f a feminist transport model we have to, to develop. <laughs> But then the question well, is, should we go into modeling at all? Is I mean, that, that's also a dimension. I think I think that's a little bit the question, and and it's it's this this idea also of um, I mean, not just in the modeling world, should we just bring in more and more elements so that you know we fit into that world, hmm. or should we create a different narrative about what's important to look at? And it's kind of the same thing. Should we get more women to come into you know this? masculine norm world so well we change the women so that they come into this world no obviously mm. that's not what we should be doing so it's it's this you know um we shouldn't be changing women we should be thinking about you know what is it how do we create the opportunities for everybody equally to have the best result so Lasse I think wants to yeah, say good thing. yeah Lasse please uh, yes, well, I mean, it was also just uh, to, yeah, ball further on uh, Anna's uh, reflections. Uh, I worked in the political uh, environment at uh, the parliament, and you could say I spent a lot of time looking into these issues, especially about, you could say, the time models and so on. And I would say the, the, the big issue is exactly as Anna says, should we try to change the models from within or should we do something else? But you could say, the challenge is that as long as the financial um, uh, people at parliament look into these kind of calculations and they define, you could say, the national economy, then it's really difficult to, in a sense, not look into that. Um, we, of course, from Ida and other good people in Denmark say that we need a mobility plan and a mobility strategy on how we should you could say, form our country, what kind of transportation do we even uh, want, uh, so on. And these questions are not being posed because you only look at, you could say, the return on investment on a, a, a road or a, 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 a... we had uh, the bicycle superhighways. Uh, I know Miami is behind me on this one, uh, <laughs> but they, they had the next highest return of all times uh, in terms of these traffic models. And even so, so that meant, I think they could, they 
would start generate positive money. I would think it, as I remember, it was after two or three years, which is insane. So, I mean, why haven't we spent the 500 million corner just doing it? We could have gotten, you could say, all the benefits from better health and maybe even some lower uh, CO2 and so on. But there's a, a dullness or like a, a slowness in the system that has to really do with the norms on why aren't we just deciding these things? And that's, you could say, that's that's a big challenge and I don't have the answer. Mm. Thanks, Lasse. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking if uh, I see, Julia, you have uh, written in the chat here to to please write your questions. And we have another five minutes. So so please include uh, questions you would like the, the panelists to, to reply to. Um, meanwhile, because I don't see any, any questions right now, but meanwhile, do you have... Um, any reflection on each other's present uh, comments that you did initially? Marianne, you're raising your hand, right? Yes, I just... Please. It was just because uh, also in the initial presentation, Julia talked about the suitcase on wheel. And I would like to talk about uh, innovation also here. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I saw the other day, I think it's 0.2% of investments uh, are going to women. Uh, and I've heard from many female entrepreneurs and, and also seen studies about this, that one of the problems is that the men have the money to invest. And then women come with great ideas that, you know, handles issues that women face, uh, but also people in general, like the rolling suitcase. But they are told that this is a niche product because it only, um, you know, is, is dedicated for uh, women. And uh, men don't get that argument at all. So we also need to invest more and really bring forward uh, female entrepreneurs and ideas and, and have these voices heard so, so that we can innovate uh, also uh, and not just continue to do what what uh, and and innovate for the people that already have all the opportunities, but try and solve some of the issues that are unsolved. Um, another reason why it's uh, important. Good comment. Uh, thanks, uh, Marianne. We, we have a question in the. Uh, yeah, and I also like Lasse wrote now, it's only half the population. Yeah, it's a niche, 50% of the population. So we have two niches then. Um, we have one question here um, from Narges. Um, could you please tell me what is future hypothesis about transport model or mobility plan? Uh, so I interpret the question as... Uh, how how should or could transport modeling look like? Uh, do you I'll, do? I'll you... take that one. Yeah, Anna, <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, but first, I'm just gonna reiterate a little bit what Mariano was talking about because I think this issue about what innovation is and what we think is innovation and and where we can get the money from. It's a really, really important topic to look at, especially when you're looking in this tech transport sector. And that's partly because when you're building tech solutions, it's like you need a lot of money up front to develop it, and then you make money afterwards. So you need to bring in the money in the beginning. It's like the, the funding is, is works in that way. Um, and, the, and, it, and it is the case that today, that if you want to get money for your startup or your innovation, it's best if you're a white, man in his 20s that's just statistically that is the best way for you to get money which makes it quite difficult when you're a black woman in your 40s for example um and we need to really address that issue and i know there's a lot of great work going on out there but we really need to think about that in the in the transport sector as well as we're becoming increasingly digitalized what this is meaning also for where the investment is going in our sector and that's also a little bit related to what I think is the future transport model. It's more to do with analyzing very large amounts of data, because now we're collecting huge amounts of data in the transport system. All of the vehicles, we're all walking around with mobile phones, we're collecting, we, data is coming all of the time. When we're thinking of, of future transport modeling, it's more about the analysis of this historical data that we're collecting. 
Uh, and I think that's the future of transport modeling is looking at these really big data sets. But there we have to be very careful also and make sure that we have the representativity so that we have socio-demographic variables within these data sets, but also that we are covering all modes of transport because at the moment um, we have a lot of data on vehicles, um, motorized vehicles I'm talking about, but less on the bicycle vehicles in the system, for example, and people walking around. So, so I say that's the future, but we have to be very aware of who we want to include in that future. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna. It's uh, 14 o'clock. Um, I would like to thank um, Julia for uh, making good presentation and thanks to Marianne, Lasse and Anna for, for discussing and commenting. Uh, here on the picture you see our email addresses, so please send us questions, thoughts, ideas uh, for the future. And as a last note, uh, those listening now who are part project partners will continue in a, in a, in a workshop and then you go to a, the Teams link that you have received. So we will turn down this, uh, this webinar link now. So you go to a Teams link that you have received. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, participating. Thanks a lot for listening and hope to keep in touch. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.